The human heart is incredibly important, and it's more interesting than you might think. It pumps all day, every day. It's controlled by nerves with a special kind of synapse, and it's even made of a unique type of muscle that's especially resistant to fatigue. But where did hearts come from? What makes them so essential for keeping us alive? And why do we even have them in the first place? Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the most important muscle in your body. But in order to understand the heart properly, we need to start by talking about blood. When you think about blood, you probably just think about it as something that keeps you alive. And it does. But it also allows complexity to evolve. Blood carries gases and ions and nutrients and waste all around your body in ways that your tissues simply couldn't accomplish on their own. Less complex animals like sponges, sea anemones, and jellyfish have thin and relatively uncomplicated tissues, so they're able to make do with simple diffusion, allowing important ions and molecules to pass in and out of their cells as they interact directly with the surrounding environment. But animals like us are just too big and too complicated for that sort of thing to be effective. We need blood to get right up against every part of our bodies, so that diffusion can happen across just a few cells at most. Some of the earliest blood that we know of is over 500 million years old, and found in the fossils of tiny creatures called Morella splendens in the Burgess Shale. These fossils are often found with a dark, greasy-looking smear of what was these animals' blood. While blood likely evolved almost 100 million years earlier, these black smudges are the earliest physical evidence of its existence. Blood back then wouldn't have needed to be as complex as it is today, only needing to be made of a few simple proteins suspended in fluid. However, today, blood is full of complex cells and intricate molecules which do important jobs all over your body. Most famously, blood is responsible for carrying oxygen. And in your body, it does that with the help of a molecule called hemoglobin. Mammalian hemoglobin molecules are actually a complex of four smaller proteins stuck together, two alpha globins and two beta globins. Each of these contains a tightly wound heme group, which is responsible for binding oxygen. This means that each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules, each of which contains two oxygen atoms. Each red blood cell, or erythrocyte, contains around 280 million hemoglobin molecules. So that comes to about 2 billion, 240 million oxygen atoms per red blood cell. And while we're talking about big numbers, each drop of blood contains a few hundred million red blood cells, for a grand total of about 30 trillion erythrocytes throughout your entire body. Your body typically uses that oxygen pretty immediately. But some animals, like certain clams and worms, can use hemoglobin for longer-term oxygen storage to make sure that their tissues still operate in low-oxygen environments. And that may sound kind of crazy until you remember that your spleen does something very similar. The human spleen contains blood vessels which are able to dilate or contract as needed. When fully expanded, your spleen can hold up to about a cup of oxygenated blood which can be released to keep you going when you need it most. Like if you were to lose blood in an accident, or need to hold your breath for a long time. One way in which we can see this amazing ability played out is in the Bajau people of Southeast Asia, who rely on fishing by way of diving, often collecting food from the sea floor. As a result, the people in this population have evolved spleens that are 50% larger than average, giving them essentially little internal scuba tanks. Some of the earliest hemoglobin in the fossil record is found in the stomach of a 46 million year old mosquito from Montana. Although molecular clock studies, which estimate evolution time based on a fixed mutation rate, estimate that hemoglobin may be at least 10 times that old, going back at least 450 million years. Looking at genetics, we now know that an ancestral globin gene, which coded for a single chain globin molecule, gave rise to the pair of genes which now code for the four chain hemoglobin proteins that we see today. Hemoglobin is also why your blood is red, and why red blood cells are also called erythrocytes, which literally translates to red cells. The heme group at the center of each globin molecule contains iron, and that is what binds oxygen. Which makes you wonder, what else do you call it when iron binds with oxygen and turns red? Rust! Red oxidized iron is called rust. Your blood is just rust water, and that's what keeps you alive. But iron isn't the only metal that can bind oxygen. Hemocyanin is a totally different blood protein which uses copper instead of iron, turning blood blue instead of red. 
Hemocyanin is less efficient than hemoglobin, but it works better in the cold, and it's evolved independently multiple different times. The hemocyanin found in arthropods, like lobsters, beetles, and such, is completely structurally different than the hemocyanin found in mollusks, like octopuses and snails. Oh, and by the way, it's what Morella splendens use too. Probably the most well-known example of an animal that has blue hemocyanin blood is the horseshoe crab, although that's not even close to the coolest thing about their blood. You see, their blood contains specialized immune cells called amoebocytes, which form gels whenever they're exposed to bacterial endotoxins. This is important because those endotoxins are released in high quantities when bacteria die. So even if we completely sterilize something, it could still be coated in endotoxins, which will make you very sick if they get into your bloodstream or your cerebral spinal fluid. This is why biomedical scientists harvest horseshoe crab blood and use the amoebocytes to produce an extract called Limulus Amoebocyte Lysate, or LAL, which is applied to pharmaceuticals and medical devices that are expected to enter your body. If no gels form, then there are no endotoxins present, which means the medicine or device or whatever is safe to use. If you've ever gotten an implant or an infusion or a joint replacement or a vaccine, you've probably been protected by horseshoe crabs and their awesome blue blood, and so have billions of other people all around the world. And red and blue aren't the only two options for blood coloration, by the way. Some worms and stuff use a protein called hemerythrin, which also uses iron, but is much more simple in structure and looks purple rather than red. And some lizard's blood has an abundance of broken down hemoglobin molecules called biliverdin, making their blood green. And even cooler, both figuratively and literally, are ice fish, which live in the frigid waters of Antarctica and so have super slow metabolisms and have evolved beyond the need for any blood proteins at all which means their blood is white or even clear. And as amazing as the diversity of blood colors is, it's got nothing on the diversity of blood types. Blood types are made by the presence or absence of antigens on a blood cell surface. An antigen is just something that provokes an immune response within the body. And in this case, these antigens are specialized proteins which stud the exterior of a red blood cell so that white blood cells can read them sort of like the cell's signature to know whether or not they're supposed to be within your body. So this means if you have type A blood, your red blood cells are studded with type A antigens. And if you have type B blood, your red blood cells are studded with type B antigens. If you have type AB blood, your red blood cells have both A and B antigens. And if you have type O blood, they have neither. Each of these antigens is coded for by a different allele of the same gene, which unsurprisingly is known as the ABO gene. The O allele is recessive, so if you have type O blood, that means you have two copies of the O allele. If, however, you have even a single copy of the A or B alleles, you'll have either type A or type B blood. And if you have one of each, you'll have AB blood. If your white blood cells detect an antigen that they don't recognize, they'll attack which means getting the wrong type of blood during a blood transfusion can be lethal, as this new blood clumps and clots and clogs up blood vessels. However, A, B, A, B, and O aren't the only level of complexity to do with blood types. There's also the RH or rhesus factor, named after the rhesus monkeys in which it was first discovered. The RH factor is yet another antigen, which may or may not be present on your red blood cells, meaning that every blood type comes with a plus and minus variety. This makes people with type O negative blood universal donors, because their antigen-free blood can be given to anybody. Meanwhile, people with type AB positive blood are universal recipients, because their white blood cells can recognize all possible blood antigens. All the possible combinations of A, B, O, plus, and minus creates a total of eight different blood groups for humans. And that sounds like a lot, until you remember that other animals are even more complicated. Dogs, for example, have 13 blood types, and cows only have 11, but their B blood type has over 60 possible antigens, leading some researchers to estimate the total number of bovine blood types as being somewhere in the hundreds. But we're getting increasingly off track. Blood is very cool and very interesting, but it isn't helpful if it's stagnant. If you want to make blood useful, you need something to move it around. Homologous genes and molecular clock estimates put the earliest hearts at around 600 million years ago, around the same time as the earliest blood. However, these early hearts didn't need to be as big and complex as ours are. 
All they really needed was to pump the muscles surrounding a major blood vessel through a process called peristalsis. We still see these simple peristaltic hearts in some animals today, and you use peristalsis every single day to squeeze your food through your digestive tract. Since then, hearts have evolved in arthropods and mollusks and vertebrates alike, going from a simple peristaltic pump all the way to a complex organ with dedicated chambers for pumping blood to different parts of the body. And just like eyes, which still display the major steps in evolutionary history among living animals, we can see the step-by-step -step development of hearts as we look at increasing levels of complexity found in worms, fish, reptiles, and mammals. And when we look at how our hearts develop today, we can still see a glimpse of that process as it happens in rapid time as two blood vessels fuse together to form a single tube, which twists in on itself to form four separate chambers. The upper two chambers of a fully developed human heart are called the atria. Their job is to collect blood from around the body so that the lower two chambers, called ventricles, can send it back out. The right side of the heart, which you see on the left of most drawings because you're looking at it from the front, draws blood from all over the body and sends it to the lungs to become oxygenated. Then the left side draws it in from the lungs and sends it back out around the body. That's why the muscular wall on the left ventricle is so much thicker and stronger than the one on the right. The heart is also loaded with specialized structures to make sure that it works as efficiently as possible, like these valves which stop blood from flowing backwards. Some of these valves are pulled tightly closed by what are known as chordae tendinae, which literally translates to tendinous cords, or as they're more commonly known, heartstrings. That's right, when you're plucking at someone's heartstrings, that's a real structure that you certainly don't want plucked. Although I should mention that the name chordae tendinae isn't nearly as cool as the name for these thick ropes of muscle embedded into the walls of the heart called trabeculae carniae, which literally translates to meat beams. What I find even more interesting about the heart, however, is its innervation, or the supply and function of its nerves. You see, when two neurons, or nerve cells, connect together so that signals can travel from one to the other, they form what's known as a synapse between the neuron sending the signal and the neuron receiving it. Most of the synapses in your body are chemical synapses. In these, the neurons are relatively far apart, and communication occurs through neurotransmitters, special chemicals which have to be released and absorbed. This makes chemical synapses great for transmitting highly specialized and localized information, which is why they're the most common type of synapse around your entire body. Electrical synapses, on the other hand, are much more direct. The two neurons are much closer together and communicate through rapid ion exchange, allowing signals to transfer almost instantly. These synapses are relatively pretty rare, but one place in which you can find them in great abundance is cardiac muscle, because they're significantly faster, insensitive to hypoxia and changes in pH, and much more resistant to fatigue all of which helps make your heart function in a way that is much safer and more efficient than other muscles throughout the body. The human heart beats, on average, around 100,000 times a day. That's 40 million beats per year and around 3 billion beats in a lifetime. And those aren't the only big numbers associated with your cardiovascular system. There are over 60,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body. That's enough to wrap around the entire Earth almost three times. But the heart isn't just biologically important for us humans. It also has great cultural significance, going back at least thousands of years. Lots of cultures believe that the heart was the seat of emotion, memory, and even intelligence. When the ancient Egyptians mummified their dead, the heart was the only organ that wasn't removed, instead being covered by a scarab charm, with instructions for the heart to not betray the person's misdeeds to the gods who judged them after their death. If they passed this post-mortem interrogation, their heart would be weighed against a feather to see if it was weighed down by their wrongdoings, and if not, the person was ready to pass on to the afterlife. The ancient Romans also had some interesting beliefs about the heart, which still have lasting implications thousands of years later. They believed that there was a single vein called the vena amoris, which stretched from the fourth finger of the left hand directly to the heart. While the Romans clearly didn't understand that all veins lead directly back to the heart, their belief is why we still wear our wedding and engagement rings on the fourth finger of our left hands to this very day. Hearts are fascinating things, anatomically, evolutionarily, culturally, and in so many more ways, but they also carry a lot of weight clinically. Without their constant pumping, our tissues don't get the nutrients that they need, and our bodies shut down fast. And that is what this video is actually about. Heart disease is the number one leading cause of death around the world. 
it kills over 19 million people a year. That's more than every form of cancer combined. Someone has a heart attack or a stroke every 40 seconds. That means that in just the time it's taking you to watch this video, at least 20 people have suffered a life-threatening event. One in a hundred babies are born with a congenital heart defect. That's 44,000 every year, and 22,000 of those need open-heart surgery. People living in lower-income areas have less access to quality food or adequate medical care, both of which have major impacts on your heart health. Here in the U.S., our dramatic stratification of socioeconomic status and the associated infrastructure means that people living just a few miles apart from each other can have a difference in life expectancy of up to 30 years. And to top it all off, 40% of adults are at a heightened risk of cardiovascular disease due to stress, poor sleep, and decreased mental health. And all of that is why this video is in support of the American Heart Association. They've funded over $5 billion of research, working to understand the causes, treatments, and prevention of heart disease and stroke. And that research saves lives all around the world. They've played a part in creating new treatments like pacemakers and artificial heart valves and even CPR standards. And they do tons of work in community outreach, education, CPR, AED training, health screenings, and more but there's still a lot of work to be done. So if you want to give the gift of a healthy heart, please use the donation link attached to this video to donate whatever you can. Neither I nor YouTube take a cut of those donations, and this video is not sponsored. 100% of your donations go directly to the American Heart Association so that they can continue saving lives. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching and donating. Please keep that heart as healthy as you can. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye!